It's time for Garage Band Weekly, episode 73. Let's do it. Y'all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Garage Band Weekly for yet another week on the show today. We'll be looking at a whole bunch of stuff. We'll be looking at the five most common Garage Band iOS questions I get asked. Uh, my rant of the week will be about abundance versus competitiveness. What does that all mean? We'll be talking Garage Band file management, and my plugin or app of the week is something a little bit left of center, something that's not really Garage Band related, but kind of is. So you have to stick around to find out what that's all about. Hello to the folks who are here live, whether you're on Twitch or Facebook or YouTube. And if you're watching on the replay, don't worry. We love you just as much. So uh, let's kick on with the show and start by having a quick cough break. <coughs> uh, now, it is, it is hoodie season here in Australia. Finally, finally, I can break out the studio live today. Hoodie. And uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm an absolute branding shill here today. Because I'm enjoying uh, enjoying a beverage from my Studio Live Today mug whilst wearing my Studio Live Today hoodie because it's finally cold enough here in Australia for me to do both of those things. <laughs> Let's look at the news of the note for the week. And it's been a bit of a slow news week, I'll be very honest with that. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things here. The uh, Patrick has a new video. Uh, yes, that Patrick. Patrick of the Garage Band Guide. And yes, you do have to say it like that. Even though I've uh, th- there's that court order out, I've actually put in an appeal against the court order for me not to be able to do accents anymore. So while the appeal's in uh, in progress, uh, I'll, I'll be able to do it again. So uh, if you haven't checked it out, if you're uh, living under a rock and you don't know who Patrick is and you don't know the Garage Band Guide, you can uh, head over and check out his new video. It's called The Best Free Plugins, my top five for 2021. Some may say Patrick's peaking a little early here because it is, uh, you know, it's, it's only May, but that's okay. He can call it. Maybe he's going to do his top 10 plugins of 2021 in October. And then, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, he's got a bunch of cool free plugins here, focusing in on GarageBand Mac. And the reason I bring you this is that I don't cover Mac as much as I do iOS. And I want to make sure that our Mac GarageBand fans out there get their fair share. So there you go. It was premiered only a couple of days ago. It's super fresh. And uh, the cool thing I like is that, uh, that Patrick has absolutely perfected. Let's just find it here. GarageBand Guide Best Free. He's perfected the, the art of the YouTube thumbnail. Look at this, it's got too many videos. We can't find the right one. Oh, where are you, Patrick? Uh, maybe we need to do 2021. Uh, because as you know, there you go. If you're a YouTube connoisseur, you'd know that the you need your face on there. Like the reason my face is here pointing at things in the GarageBand Weekly thumbnail is that it's been actually proven in A-B testing that having a face on a thumbnail makes more people click on it than not having a face. And it's more recently been proven that the more open your mouth is, the more people are going to click on your thumbnail. So Patrick, yeah, I reckon you could get yourself about 30% more open there, mate. I want to see you really shocked and surprised at how free these GarageBand plugins are. Uh, we joke because we love, and uh, I love the GarageBand guide. So keep uh, keep on trucking over there and check out Patrick's new video. Speaking of Patrick's new video in completely unrelated news, but speaking of merch, uh, I was pretty happy. And this is, this is again, GarageBand adjacent because... I released a video this week about how I put out my merchandise because it's actually way simpler than people think. People think that to get you know t-shirts and to get mugs and to get hoodies, it's like the old days where you have to get a printing company, you have to order in boxes of the stuff, they have to sit in your garage and you end up with a whole bunch of unsold stock. That was 20 years ago. Now, everything is POD, print on demand. And that means that anyone, you, yes, you, I'm talking to you, can have their own merchandise store. And someone who I'm very happy to see has their own merchandise store is the one and only Gary Hubs. And uh, this is relevant to GarageBand because Gary is a GarageBand creator. So Gary Hubs, a couple of years ago, didn't have music out there, wasn't creating music. He jumped in, he grabbed GarageBand, he had an iPhone 6S, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, or a 7, had a very early iPhone, had a very dodgy old iRig, now he's rocking the iRig Pro Duo, but so he's, uh, he's leveled up. But he recorded and made some amazing music just using GarageBand on his phone. And now you can live the Hubs experience because check it out. He's now launched his own range of t-shirts. Of course, they're black because they have to be. And uh, I'm actually a big fan of this one. I think I might be grabbing this one. Let's, uh, let's, let's hook this up here, shall we? Uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get a lot. Look at that. That's that Hubs, the ZZ Top Hubs logo. I'm going to get it before ZZ Top come after Gary. 
uh, and uh, and get him to to take it down. So uh, we'll add one of these to my cart. So super simple here using Teespring. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and buy myself a Gary Hubs t-shirt. Uh, is there anything there you can't see? Probably. I'll come over here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Teespring is uh, is very, very cool. Uh, am I using Shopify and Printful? No, I'm just literally using um, using Teespring. So it's now called Spring. It was Teespring, uh, but previously it was Spring. That's right. I, I was looking at what I was showing there. I didn't, I'm like, did, did that have my credit card number on there? No, thankfully that wasn't uh, displayed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can go ahead and order that. And the only challenge here is that uh, even though it's only $30 Australian, because it's shipping from the US and then GST on top of that, it's actually going to cost me $52 to buy that t-shirt. So I better buy two. <laughs> Why not buy two, hey? Yeah, spring is pretty cool. Sale number one. Yeah, so I will complete that sale when I can do it off camera, Gaz, because uh, yeah, otherwise uh, I'm, I'm, people will be sitting there with their notepads down going, credit card, Pete Johns, uh, PO Box. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, there you go. You can use that. And uh, if you do want to, uh, if you want to make your own merch store, uh, if you search on the YouTubes, let's just find it. I reckon if you search my name and merch, Pete John's merch, uh, it should bring up that video. Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, Pete John's uh, your own merch. Okay, see, uh, there we go. So type Pete John's Your Own Merch and you'll be able to go to the video there. And of course, if you want some Studio Live Today merch, you can come in here and search studiolivetoday.com slash merch. That will take you to my Teespring store. And then after you've picked up a Gary Hubs t-shirt, you can pick up. See, everyone's going there. It's, it's actually delayed because everyone's buying things. There you go. You can go there and pick yourself up this, this exact hoodie or the t-shirt or the mug. And uh, my stuff's a bit cheaper than Gary. Just saying, Gazza, you know, I've got to keep the prices down. Make them affordable. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the uh, the only other uh, news I had, so we're in this sort of holding pattern at the moment where we're waiting on the new iMacs to actually hit people's hands. We're waiting on the new iPad Pro 2021s. They're all coming in mid to late May. I'm sure the Renee Richies of the world will get their hands on them earlier because of course they will. So we're sitting back and waiting to find out what that will do. I mean, the iMacs are running the same exact M1 chips that the current Mac Mini that I'm using and the MacBook Pro are using um, and the MacBook Air. But the uh, the iPad Pro M1 is what everyone is waiting with bated breath. I mean, from a GarageBand perspective, they're just going to crush it. My 2020 iPad Pro crushes GarageBand. The new M1 iPads are going to crush GarageBand. So there'll be no problems there. Uh, one final thing that I'll mention here, and actually it's related to that, because uh, while, we're, while we're there, what you'll notice is, actually you can't notice it there because I don't, I don't have it on my front page store there. But if you go to, I think it's teespring.com slash GBU dark. Uh, let's see if I can remember. There, there you go. So I've actually made uh, these here. And you can see they're even cheaper. I sell these at cost price because I, don't, I didn't design the logo. That's Ron Ward over at the GarageBand Users Group who design, designed that logo. But you can pick yourself up a GarageBand Users t-shirt for, look, 15 bucks. I think it's like $12 US. It's ridiculously cheap. Uh, and they come in a range of colors, blue. And you got your red. I might get one of these next time. Even though the red kind of blends into the red, um, I kind of dig it. Uh, or the racing green. This is what looks pretty cool too, actually. Might go the green. Green and red. That, that way I can wear it at Christmas time and represent GarageBand users then. Uh, so yeah, do pick up those. There's teespring.com slash GBU dark. You can go GBU light as well if you want a lighter color t-shirt. Uh, but I think the darker color ones look much, much cooler. Uh, and the reason I mentioned that is I wanted to uh, also uh, give a shout out to the GarageBand users Facebook group. Now I know. Especially now that I've checked, I checked my demographics the other day on this channel. And would you believe that the number one age bracket that watches Studio Live today? See if you can guess. Throw, throw it in the chat here right now. What do you think the number one age bracket demographic that watches Studio Live today is? Who do you think my average punter is that's watching this channel? It's weird. It, it blew me away. I wasn't, I wasn't convinced that it was correct. But uh, while, while you're thinking about that, come over here to Garage Band Users Facebook group and uh, we'll click it and show you here. So uh, here you go. Real people, real music, Garage Band users, 11.6 thousand members. Now, when I joined, we had less than a thousand because uh, I didn't create this group. I'm just a, a happily a moderator of the group. But uh, yeah, 11.6 thousand members of the Garage Band Users Facebook group. And uh, it is very cool. You got Ron Ward there doing his GBU Live show that he does at least once a week, usually twice a week. Uh, so you can check that out. A lot of great music being shared. There you go. 
sharing Z uh, Gary Hubbs' ZZ Top cover. See, it's all coming together here. Uh, so yeah, we've got a lot of folks there. I won't show you too many of those because uh, yeah, it is a private group. Uh, as you can see there, private group. So uh, I won't uh, I won't show too much of that. Um, but yeah, do join that. Just jump over to Facebook and check out the Garage Band Users Facebook group. All right, what, what do we think the age rackets are? 30 to 50? That's what I would have thought. I would have thought around that 35 to 45 mark. Darren, 57? <laughs> <laughs> Green and red beer label. There you go. Uh, Tom Rochelle says 18 to 24. Audible video says 49. Darren Anderson, 40 to 50 age bracket. Yeah, so you're all around, <laughs> joking, 18 to 70. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, guess what? Now, Tom Rochelle probably knows this because he's one of my patrons, and I, I think I've mentioned this on, uh, on a Patreon live stream recently, but 18 to 24. Is the, so more of you are 18 to 24 than are 25 to 34 or 35 to 44. I was blown away by that. And it goes up in that order too. 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44. So here I am, old man Johns, telling people to get off my lawn and yelling at clouds. And yet apparently I need to... Uh, I need to start understanding memes and and uh, and using letters instead of words or something. What whatever it is the kids do. Anyway, that's just an aside there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello to the folks who are here live. Hello to Russ. Uh, hello to Jerome. Hello to Bubba. S M Borthwick's here. Tom Rochelle with us. Said good day to Mark Bros in the house. We've got uh, Night Train nineteen eighty eight. Thought I'd pop in and say hello. Yeah, no, it's very late for the folks who are here in uh, here in the UK and uh, and Europe. Uh, Wing Chun, everybody, Wing Chun tonight. No, that was Wang Chung. Anyway, uh, thank you. Here via Jade Star. Yeah, I did actually catch some of Jade's show today. <laughs> Jade's doing an early show now, uh, which uh, it is good because I can actually catch it sometimes. Uh, Ed Z is in the house here. There's Mister Mister Gary Hubs. Nina's in here as well. A bunch of folks. If you do have questions, John Frank songs. Good day to you. If you do have questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer. We do do some Q and A during the show as well. Just put the word question in your question, and we'll answer your question. So here's all you need to do. Just put the word question in front of your comment and I'll keep an eye on the chat for any questions that you may have that will pop up there. But for now, let's, uh, let's move on up because we've got a feature topic this week. And what I thought I would cover is what are the five most common GarageBand iOS questions that I get asked in the comments of my videos? And why haven't I made a video on these yet? I don't know. Maybe that's what we're going to be doing here today. <laughs> this will become a video. Uh, that's getting a bit meta. Let's jump here into GarageBand and take a look because GarageBand is one of those things that is kind of like Texas Hold'em poker. It takes a, a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. So there's a lot of things in here that when you're a beginner or when you're an intermediate user, you may not know, or even if you do know, you may not know that there's maybe a better way to tackle it. So that's what I thought I would go with today. Now I'm using this uh, sort of dodgy kind of loop that we've got here, but I thought, oh, we've got an eight bar loop and it's got it's got all three different types of instruments. So it's got a audio track, it's got a drummer track, and it's got a MIDI track in here and another audio track just for good measure. So uh, at the moment, it sounds like this. It sounds like nothing. Why do we have no audio? Uh, hold the line, please, while we uh, while we get some audio going on here. Is it trying to airplay? Is that the problem? Uh, let's see. It is. Let's uh, let's just do a quick. Maybe this is a bonus tip. There you go. This can be a bonus tip because when I plug in, I'm using an app called Reflector uh, on my Mac, and I've got my uh, my iPad here and it's reflecting directly to my Mac using AirPlay. So what I may need to do is actually come to the top corner here and uh, tap on here. There we go. What I can do is I can bring this over to the Steinberg UR22C and that's what I feared. We would lose that one. So I'm going to have, to, I've been experimenting with some different things here today. So apologies, you get to be the guinea pig. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the audio interface. We are going to re-mirror the Mac uh, to the Mac mini screen here from my iPad. So here it comes. I know, the anticipation. There we go. And it'll give us this pop-up. It'll say, using AirPlay, Johns. And I'll be like, oh, no, I don't want to use AirPlay, though. So now I'm going to plug back in. I thought I could just change it on the fly. Turns out I can't. So I'm going to plug in my audio interface now. I'm using the USB-C to USB adapter. And what I should get is that, which is telling me that now I'm monitoring through my actual Steinberg. And if I want to check, I can come up to the top here and I can tap it. There you go. So hopefully it will give me both the screen that you can see and the audio will come through this channel on my mixer and a drum roll, please. 
Yeah, yeah. There you go. We're set. Only took us another three minutes to actually get set up. We'll have a quick drink. And let's uh, let's get on with this. So, number one, how do I add more bars and sections? Now, this is 100% the most common question that I get because GarageBand doesn't make it easy to see how you actually extend this. We're like, oh, we've got eight bars here, right? How do we get more than eight bars? Go to my settings, uh, there's my tempo, there's my time signature, there's my key. Uh, uh, how do I add more? Well, guess what? It's in the most obvious location, of course. It is this tiny plus button over here. This is what we tap on. Now, I know many of you already know this, but there's a few things that we can talk about with this. So we tap that plus button, and then we can change the length of this section. So say instead of eight bars, we actually wanted this to be 16 bars. We can come in here and we can tap this. Now, a tip for young players is if you tap and hold, you can actually drag up and drag down. So don't sit there doing, if you need 64 bars, don't do any of this business. Just tap on the number and drag up or down. So we'll go there, 16 bars. And then when we tap out of there, boom, we've now got 16 bars. Now with your virtual instruments, this is why I wanted a bunch of different tracks here. You'll see your virtual instruments just loop for the whole way through. If you don't want that, all you need to do is bring that loop back like that and do the same with that one. But we'll undo and we'll undo because we do want them there. If you want to loop these ones, well, yep, we can just tap this one and tap it again and hit the loop button. No, we can't. No, it's in the settings here. Settings looping. Why is that not working? <laughs> it's made a mockery of the whole thing. Is this gonna work if I loop this one? Looping is on. That's 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 strange. Uh, there you go. Apparently that doesn't loop. I thought that's I thought that would work. I thought it would let me loop. Uh, okay, well what we'll do is we'll just copy it and we'll paste it in another version. <laughs> There you go. If anyone has any tips for me as to why that's not working, uh, let me know because that's a bit, bit weird. We'll see if that happens the same way later on. Might have found a new bug in the latest GarageBand version. But there you go. Now we've got this 16 bars. Now there's other things you can do here. If we tap back on the little plus button and go to our little hidden section, we can duplicate that section. So now we've got two 16 bar sections and we can even add a fresh section. And you'll see that it'll default to eight bars. Again, if you want to change it, we tap the I button there and we can change it to however many bars we want. Let's just go 24 bars. Now you'll notice... <coughs> Now you'll notice that there's an automatic button there as well. So you can actually set automatic and that's good if you're just recording for the first time. You can just have automatic and then the section will be as long as however long you record. So uh, keep that in mind as well there. Now when you're viewing your sections, if you tap on one, so we go section B here and come back out, you'll see that we're only getting that one section. So if you want to see your whole track, this is something that traps some people. We need to tap all sections here and we come back to all of them there. You can see we've got Darcy there. See, why has Darcy been added to that new blank section, but the bass hasn't? It's a, weird, it's a weird difference between the drummer and the bass track that we have there. So there's your sections. To delete them again, you can just come here and we can tap that one and uh, actually delete them by swiping. You can't see my swipe action, but we swipe to the left and there's a little delete thing there. So swipe to the left and then you can tap the delete. So let's just get rid of this little eight bar one, delete that, and it's gone. And again, to view all your sections, tap all sections, tap off here, and there you go. So there you go, crash course, everything you wanted to know about adding sections, adding more bars, removing, and uh, changing things around. But we're afraid to ask. I don't know why you'd be afraid to ask. You can ask anything. In fact, if you have questions, you may ask them, drop them in the comments of this video. Let's uh, let's continue on here and look at our next one, which I need to come over here to see. Uh, yeah, so speaking of loops, how do we loop just one section? So say we're recording along with this. Let's just say that we wanted to record a cool keyboard part to just this first section, but we wanna try, we wanna do a few takes on it because we're not really confident in ourselves. So what we can do, let's come in here, we'll add a keyboard. Let's just find like an organ or something cool that might go along with this track, a bit of a door style track that we got going on here. So we'll go here, we'll go to keyboards and we'll go to one of our rock organs, I reckon. Classic rock organ, there you go. And let's just see, I can't remember what key this is in. All right, we'll play something. We'll play something around about there, starting on G. 
So we'll remember that. So I'll come back here, we'll turn this organ up and we'll turn the other tracks down a little bit just so that we can hear it while we're recording. Now, what you could do is just be in this mode, but then when you record, what's going to happen is it's just going to get to the end of here and that's it. It's going to keep going through here. But what if we want to view one loop? Well, all we need to do is come in here and select the section we want. So say we want section A, then we can come here and it's going to give us just section A. Now, what I'm going to do is just to make this more convenient, let's just bring the section back down to say four bars, just so that we can do this. And there you go. We've got the first four bars of this. And we've now got a four bar section and then a 16 bar section here. So if we come over here and we get ready to record. All right. So we'll hit the record button and we'll record in and uh, let's just watch what happens here. So it's gone through twice there, yeah? We've recorded through twice. And there you go. We've got our recording there. Now, there's a couple of options that we have in here for when we're recording and when we're looping here. If we come in here and we go to track settings and recording, you'll see we've got multi-take and merge recordings. Now, without any of those, what you'll notice is that when I played it the second time, it just kept recording. It just records straight over the top. But we can actually change how that works. Let's undo that recording. Let's turn merge recordings on, shall we? And uh, I'll hit record here and we'll record with our merge recordings function and I'll show you what happens. And that will continue looping and recording forever. Here's the thing it does. It brings it together. <laughs> so every time we play a second note, it's actually going to bring them together. So every time we play another note that's not the original note, it's going to record that over the top. And uh, we get... We get interesting sounds like that. Not exactly what you'd want for this one, but it's an option. If you're recording something, especially drums, if you want to layer drums, so say you want to record the kick drum, and then you want to immediately loop and play the snare, and then immediately loop and play the hi-hat, you can do that, and you can build up your track. And of course, you don't have to just loop it. You can pause in between, work out your part, and do the next bit. The other thing we've got, if we turn merge recordings off, we've got multi-take. So if we undo that again, multi-take will do it a different way. So let's see how multi-take works when we're recording this loop. So we hit record, and once again, we forgot to unsolo, <laughs> but you'll get the point. So this time, it's actually re-recording that over and over and over again. And when we pop out here, you'll see we've got this little number two there. We can now switch between these takes using the multi-take feature. So we can go back to that first take that we did that sounded like this. Let's see how, let's see how on the grid Pete can be without his metronome. Not good. So we're like, oh, I didn't like that first take. What did I play on that second take? Let's try that one. Tap takes, go to take two and then come back here and play it. Yeah, pretty handy feature. So they're the two ways that you can do loop recordings. You're either gonna overwrite the original one by having nothing on here. You are going to merge your recordings together, meaning that every time you play, it'll add to the original recording, or you are going to use multi-take recording. Now, if you're recording here on this track, on an audio track, you'll notice you've only got multi-take. The reason for that is it'll always overwrite. So it's only a MIDI track or a virtual track that you have that merge recordings option on. If you're using an audio recorder track, you can use multi-take but you can't use the merge recording. So there you go. If you've ever wanted to get that face-melting guitar solo just right and play it again and again, using something like the multi-take might be a good option for you there. And if you wanted to build up some chords or build up some drum parts using your MIDI tracks, then maybe consider the multi-take. So that's how you can manage your looping of sections here in GarageBand. Let's move on to number three, shall we? This one confused a lot of folks when they first started using GarageBand, and that is why do we have two different reverbs and echoes? 
in GarageBand. Well, I'm going to tell you why. And it's actually a legacy feature. So originally, way back when, GarageBand version 2.0 came out and it only had master effects. So we didn't have any of this business. We didn't have the plugins and EQ. We didn't have AUV3 plugin support. We didn't have visual EQ. We didn't have external plugins. We didn't have a lot of things. All we had were these sections here. We had a single knob compressor. We had a treble and we had a bass. So we had very basic EQ settings. And then we had these, master echo and master reverb. So on each track, so let's just, uh, let's solo a track here. We'll go with, um, oh look, I did some weird thing and recorded over there. Uh, we'll go with this track up the top here. So this is a guitar track. Yep. So we'll turn that one up just so that we can hear it. So what we could do in the past is that all we could do is do a basic compression. So if we want a little compression on this guitar, turn up the compressor. We had some basic EQ controls. So say we wanted to boost some treble. And maybe we wanted to cut a little bass. We could do that. And we also had the master effects. Now master effects, you can add some echo. So if we hit this one, that kind of sounds cool. <laughs> and we had some reverb, so we can throw in some reverb. And that's all we had. GarageBand was a very simple application. We didn't have anything apart from that. What happened in GarageBand version 2.1 is that we got the plugins and EQ, and that changed things around a bit. But because we wanted backwards compatibility, what Apple did is they left all this business here. So if you ever wonder why you've got this little sort of simplified version out here, and then you can come in here and change it all up, well, it's because of this. So what happens when you use the compressor here and the treble and bass here is it actually changes it in here. So what you're doing is, see how it's changed the compression threshold? It's up the ratio. It's added in compression compression here based on what we've done. So if we turn this compressor way up, let's come out here, you can see the threshold's gone down and we've got more compression going on there. If we come back and we reduce the compressor, come back to here, look at that, the threshold's gone way down. So that, if you've ever wondered like, what is this doing and why is it separate? It's just controlling that compressor. Same with our treble and bass. Just for, uh, let's just boost the treble and reduce the bass and we go to plugins and EQ and we go to the visual EQ, that's what it's done here. It's just given us a boost around 5K and it's given us a cut at 200 Hertz. So that is what those simplified controls are doing. Now back to the original question, why do we have echo and reverb here? Well, it's because it was all that we had, but these don't link to anything else. So we do have some track effects now. Difference being that these ones here, if we tap on this master effects little arrow here, we can change the type of echo we get. So one that I like to use a lot is a quarter note echo. So we'll tap quarter note echo for our echo and reverb, we can change this one. So let's go with like a large hall reverb here. Now, once we've made these master effects, what you'll notice is when you go to each of your other tracks, they're exactly the same. So you can't change, you can't have say a half note on this organ and then go a quarter note on your guitar. Once you set it with the master, you gotta use it for all of them. So keep that in mind with your master effects. Now, what if say I wanted a quarter note on this guitar, but these drums, I wanted an eighth note. So we want two different types of echo. Well, in that case, we wouldn't use our master effects. We'll turn those off. We're gonna use our track effects. And this is where GarageBand now, 2.3.10 or whatever version you're running or in the future is so much better because we can come in here and we can actually go to edit our plugins and we can add and let's add in, we're right here in effects, let's add in a track echo. So the reason it's called track echo is it's to make sure you're not confused with the track echo and the master echo. And you can see here, we've got a whole bunch more controls. So you've got your dry wet knob there, you've got how much repeat you get, you've got the coloring there, so you can adjust the EQ of it. And we can, again, we can have a quarter note delay on this one. So let's play this with our quarter note delay. So that's cool, yeah? We've got a quarter note delay. And now if we want these drums to have an eighth note delay, we can come and do the same thing. We can come in here, we can add this one, go to our track echo, and this time we want to dial in an eighth note. So then our drums can have this. Bring them together.
So there you go. That is why we have two different places for plugins. You've got your legacy section here. And to be honest, I still use these quite a bit. Uh, it can be really cool on a final mix to just put a little bit of the same reverb. So a little bit of like a whole reverb on every track can kind of glue your mix together. So I still do use these master effects, but more often than not, you want to jump in here and use your track effects in GarageBand. So there you go. The number three question has been answered. Question number four. What are these buttons? What's this red and orange button all about? Why would you use them? Why are they there? So when you start out with GarageBand, you will probably see something like this. You won't even see anything there. You'll just be playing around with your tracks. You'll be adding things in. You'll be like, oh, okay, cool. I want to add some drums. And you come in here and you, you roll the dice on this one. And you record in, oh, you record in some beat sequencer. Why not? And you're away, you're having fun, yeah? You're mixing things together. You'll very quickly learn that if you pull out this panel, so if you tap on this little handle here and drag to the right, like so, that you're gonna get all these here. You're gonna get all these volume controls here. You're also gonna get your mute and your solo. So most folks know how these all work. You can solo each track, you can mute individual tracks. <coughs> Excuse me. Frog in my throat today. So you can do that. The other things you might notice here, though, you probably don't have these when you're first starting out because unless you're doing multi-track recording, you won't have these. And the reason that you have these is if you've got an audio interface connected, so I'm using a Steinberg UR22C, you can use a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, a iRig Pro Duo, there's a bunch of different interfaces, you can actually do multi-track recording. So if we tap on the settings here and go to our advanced settings, you want to turn this on, multi-track recording. And depending what you've got plugged in, sometimes even without an interface, this will actually show up your, your options. So if we come in here, the reason we've got this is, say we're, we've got our interface plugged in, because we do, and we've got a guitar in, into input two and a mic in input one, and we want to record these both at the same time. Here's how it works. So we tap on the plus button here. We come to, say we want to use an amp simulator. So we'll go here, we'll say, yeah, we want a clean guitar amp sim. There you go. We'll go to our, um, our input here. And what we want to do is say, we want this on channel two. So our guitar is coming into channel two. Cool. That's all set up. We then want to record a vocal and our vocal mic over here. Here we go. We'll take audio recorder voice. Our vocal mic happens to be in channel one. So we'll make sure that we've got input one. Now, never choose stereo, by the way, unless it is a stereo signal. I had a question during the week from someone saying, why is my microphone always on the left? Uh, it, it's because... If you've selected stereo, it'll record input one onto the left channel and input two onto the right channel. So if you've got nothing in input two, it's just going to record your mic on the left channel. So never use stereo unless you've got a stereo source. So input one for that one. Now, if we come back out here, you'll see that we have these two tracks set up. And if I just have this one selected, so say I've got my guitar plugged in, I don't. But if we hit record now, it's going to give us a count in. I'm rocking out with my guitar. I'm doing my thing. Uh, it's not recording anything, so it's not plugged in, but it's only gonna record that one track. But what if I wanna sing and play guitar at the same time? Let's just undo. If I wanna do that, what I need to do is actually select this record light, because now you can see that it'll actually record both tracks at once. It'll record my guitar and my mic using the two different channels. If we now hit record, you can see we've got a little number two there. And look what's happening. And you know what's super cool about this? you get to actually record on this screen. Yeah, it doesn't drop you over to the other screen. So when we only had the one track recording, we turned that light off, we had the one track recording, we were getting this screen, which I hate, because you can't see where your track is. But the beauty part of having the two different ones, just undo that, of having two tracks, is that you can see the screen. Now, I use this technique even when I'm only recording one track. I'll just set up a dummy track and actually just record here so that I can view my entire GarageBand screen while I'm recording. It's a good little tip if you've got a multi-channel interface so that you can see what the heck you're doing. Now, the final thing is, what are these lights? What are these uh, orange lights here? Well, these are your monitor. So if you've recorded, so say we've got our, our microphone here. If we go into here, you'll notice that you can turn your monitoring on and off in the bottom corner here. So you've got your channel set up, you're ready to record. Monitoring just means that you'll hear it back through the software as you're recording. Now you can also use latency-free monitoring on your interface. So if you turn that on, turn this off. 
But if you want to monitor with your effects, your reverb, your delay, your compression, you want to turn this on and you also want to turn your monitoring off on your interface. So you should always have only one. Otherwise, you're going to get some echo effect and some latency and some delay because you're not going to hear them exactly in sync and in time. So keep that in mind. So monitor off, monitor on. And what you'll notice here is with this one off, when we come back out to here, what is this orange light doing? It's off. We turn this orange light on, this connects to our monitor option down here. It's now said that that's on. And the same with our guitar. The guitar is in a slightly different location, but if we do monitor on here and we go into our guitar amp, what you'll notice is when we go to our little jack plug here, we've got monitor on. If we turn it off, guess what? We come back to here and where's our monitor light? It is off. So that is what that's all about. So if you want to hear both of those, you want to record both tracks, you want to hear both of them, you'd have both of those lights on. If you're only recording one, then you make sure that you turn the other one off. And if you say only want to hear the guitar, but you don't want to hear the vocal for whatever reason, you can only monitor the guitar and then you're only hearing one or the other. There you go. That's your record and your monitor lights and how to use multi-track recording here in GarageBand. Number five, and I've been using it all the way through. And it's actually a really cool feature, and that is undo. But not only undo, but redo. Because a lot of folks sometimes tell me, Pete, I just did an epic recording. Let's uh, let's just pretend. We'll we'll, uh, we'll delete these out. Let's just pretend that you just did an epic guitar recording. Yeah. So you've come in here, and uh, we've recorded this. We'll record the guitar and the vocal. We've just done an amazing take. That's only two bars, but pretend that's the whole way through. We've just done this amazing take and we're just like, oh yeah, what, what am I doing here? And you tap on this, you're like, oh, I just hit undo. Oh no, it's gone. It's gone forever. Except it's not because all you need to do is tap and hold on the undo button and guess what? Redo. Yeah, this has been a game changer for a lot of folks because it's super easy to undo and because you can undo multiple levels, and you can just keep undoing. If you tap and hold now, you can actually redo, and it'll always let you redo the next level up to, I think, 10. I think it's a maximum of 10 that you have there. But if you tap and hold, you can select to undo the last one or redo the last one. So if you do a whole bunch of undos and you find, you realize you've done something wrong and you've undone something you didn't want done, 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 and you want to redone, did do it, then you can tap that. Tap and hold. Tap and hold, and you've got your redo right there next to your undo. Isn't that cool? I think it's pretty darn cool. Bonus question number six that I get, six that many, is can you record professional sounds with GarageBand? Can you do professional recordings? Well, yeah, it depends on your definition of professional, but I 100% think you can because I've recorded an entire album in GarageBand on my iPhone and my iPad. I've recorded singles, I've recorded EPs. And if you want to learn how to record using GarageBand on your iPhone or iPad, check out my GarageBand beginner's guide. You can just head on over to GarageBand, no, you can't, to studiolivetoday.com slash courses, and you'll be able to check out my GarageBand beginner's guide. Just $10, and you get to get a five hours worth of all that stuff. If the last 20 minutes is something that you were into and you were learning lots of stuff, yeah, jump over there. Five hours of curated content for just $10. Studiolivetoday.com slash courses. All righty, we'll move on here. Mark Lovell, hello to you. Redo, I wish I knew that yesterday. Well, now you know for tomorrow. Like it's, I know, a lot of this stuff, the reason I do this and people are like, Pete, you give the same garage band tips again and again. We've heard all this, mate. And then they'll get halfway through a video like that and they'll go, ah, I didn't know that that's how that worked. I didn't know that the, the old plugins linked to the new plugins in that way, etc. So there's always something new to learn, at least in, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, I'll just scroll back up here. I know there's been a lot of chatter while I was ranting there, but if anyone has any specific questions that I've missed, uh, now is your time. You can throw that in the chat here. Uh, Housecat House says, uh, so I'm having an issue with the Alchemy synth based instruments. Not sure if it's a glitch or something with my device, but the sustain button no longer sustains the notes expected. Well, that's a weird one. Uh, let's come in here. So the Alchemy synth bass with sustain. Maybe a little bit specific to uh, to go into detail here, but let's just let's just pop one up. So if we'll go over here to our Alchemy synth, Alchemy synth, we'll grab a bass. We'll go with the uh, 808 because of course we will. <laughs> so so you're saying that the sustain is not sustaining. So if you turn your sustain on. That is weird, actually. 
with the sustain on, with the sustain on, it keeps returning to that original note. That may be a glitch. I've not really used that before. I've not played around much with uh, with these sort of basses, but that is that is a strange one. Because here's without the sustain on. And then if we turn the sustain on, when you hit your first note, and I don't know if that's by design or not. So that may indeed be a glitch or a bug there. Yeah, let me know. If anyone else is having the same problem with that one, let me know, because... Uh, yeah, hadn't personally come across it, but I don't use a lot of the 808 or a lot of the Alchemy bass synth there. But uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's definitely something that is a thing. All righty. Um, uh, so Nate, hello to you, says, I want to use GarageBand to sample my Moog DFAM and use the samples to play live. Is it possible to sync external synths to a clock metronome in GarageBand so that it's all in tempo? Um, not really. GarageBand has really rudimentary MIDI controller or MIDI in and out options and doesn't have any MIDI learn or MIDI CC functionality much at all. So you can plug in a controller and you can control this. So if I had my MIDI keyboard plugged in, I'd be able to play this synth just using my external keyboard. But in terms of triggering and sending things back the other way, it's not really feasible. So there is a clock setting here in advanced settings. You can uh, send the MIDI clock here out of GarageBand. So if you're using other apps, so if you're using Cubasis or if you're using other synth apps uh, that you want to sync up, you can send the MIDI clock there in your advanced settings, but that's about it. There's not a whole lot in the way of, um, of MIDI functionality. You probably need to look for something different. I'm thinking like Beatmaker or maybe even Aurea Pro, something like that, that has a lot better functionality and options for that. So sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but one thing GarageBand doesn't do well is handle any MIDI control options, MIDI CC, MIDI learn, etc. cetera. Uh, if you do have any other questions, uh, do throw them here in the chat because uh, we've got... Uh, We've uh, got plenty of time. There you go. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, there is the GarageBand beginner course that you can check out there. Barry Glenn, hello to you, Baz. I was trying to get an even snare drum sound, but as my pressure was uneven, so was the sound. Any way of evening out the sound? I'm glad you asked, Barry, because yes, uh, I've done a video about this. I can't remember where it is. Uh, probably one of my drum-related videos, but let's show you right now because it's super simple. If you are programming drums, especially if you are using the manual drums, it can be super difficult. And I, I was frustrated for a long time playing around with this when I first got into GarageBand. So let's go to our drums. We'll go to an acoustic kit here. And let's just say that we're trying to play in a kit here. So we'll go. Can you hear that? Like, can you hear that? Like we've got sensitivity control, which is cool, except it's really hard. If we hit record here and we try and play it in drums. So there you go, we've played in our drums. We'll just take the drummer off so that we're not distracted by two drums there. So there's our drums that we're playing along with these guitars. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, here, here's our sound. all over the place here. And if you come in here and we go into our edit mode, we'll be able to see that the velocity of each of these is everywhere. So there's our kick drum. And if you go to velocity, like some of our kick drums are like middling velocity. Some of them in the middle there, that one's like really quiet. <laughs> so they're everywhere. That one's really loud, see? And then the same with our snare. So you're getting really soft snares, you're getting hard snares, another soft snare, soft snare. Now, what's the fix for these? Well, it's pretty simple. What I do is I turn velocity off completely or at least turn it down. So where do we do that? If we come back in here to our drum, we tap on the drum, make sure you're in your drums. So here, and then go to your settings here. Up in the track settings in the top left, velocity sensitivity. It'll be on medium by default. Never use high because it's really hard to control. I would put it on low that way you get a much more even sound, but still a little bit of control. Or what I tend to do is leave it off. I know you're gonna lose your dynamics and drummers are like going, oh, but what if you want a softer snare hit? I would rather do it evenly like this so I can get a bit of a, <laughs> try to do it with two hands here. I would rather have that and be able to control it 
than have to go back in and change a lot of stuff. And then once you've recorded, yeah, of course, you can come back in here and you can use your edit to emphasize or to try and add in some ghost notes or do whatever you need to do there. So that is my tip. Anytime you're playing in drums, first thing I do is come in here, go into there, go into my track settings and turn velocity sensitivity all the way off. You will find that you get much more even drum sounds in your garage band tracks. Alrighty. Infarction. Hello to you. Uh, yeah, my, my friend Brian here sent me a track yesterday. Very cool new track. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, I've been having some problems with AUV3 plugins whereby I change a setting to get the sound effect I want, then move to another track or session and the plugin resets. Very annoying. Any fix? So the fix for this one should be to update. So there was an issue with well, there all sorts of issues with AUV3 plugins in recent versions of GarageBand. Uh, there were problems where they were missing completely. So you'd come in here to add a new plugin. You'd go here and there'd be nothing in here. There'd be another problem where you'd come here and all these icons would be orange. They would all look like these icons. Uh, you would have other problems where doing exactly what you're saying there, that you painstakingly set all of your, your meticulous options here, and then you'd come back to it afterwards and they'd all reset. Now, there are still some AUV3 plugins. I know you're using Sensual Sax at the moment, and that was having some issues with its settings where it would the Legato settings and things would be disabled, and I'm not sure if they've fully resolved those yet, but in uh, iOS version 14.5 and uh, GarageBand 2.3.10, the combination of those two seems to have fixed most problems for most people. So it may be a case of just checking your updates, making sure you're updated to the latest version of, uh, of iOS in particular, but also GarageBand. And if you're, if you're new to the iOS world and you need to know where you go to do your updates, so I'll just jump in here and make sure there's nothing I can't show you. No, we're cool. What you need to do is jump on over to here Go to your general section, go to software update. It'll check for updates there. And there you go. I'm on iPadOS 14.5.1. iPadOS is up to date. If there's an update there, that's the spot where you'll need to update it. And that should fix things out for ya. All right, uh, let's move on here. We've got a few more things to go through. And we're actually running a bit behind time this week. So we may have to be a bit quick. So I'll make my rant quick. And it's this. There is abundance in the world. I've been interacting in the last couple of weeks, and one thing I've noticed is that not all the time, but in some cases, there's a lot of competitiveness going on. And whether it's competitiveness in like reality TV shows, not just music shows, but all those other stupid shows where it's someone's competing against someone else, and especially within the music community, whenever I see competitions, whenever I see, well, who's got the best this, the best that, it always makes me feel a little bit weird because, I don't know, I may be an old hippie, but I think that music is one of the few spaces where we don't need to have competition because the more music we have, the better. The reason that I do this channel and the reason that I do this show and the reason that we talk about this and that I think GarageBand is so cool is it has lowered the barrier to entry for people to get their music into the world. It's helping more people create, record and release more music. We've got an abundance of music. And why is that good? Because a lot of people will say, but that's bad, Pete, because people with lower quality are getting to put their stuff out there. Yeah, but they're getting to do that and then they're getting to learn from it and improve. So yes, it's going to increase the amount of lower quality stuff because people have GarageBand in their bedrooms, but isn't that good? Don't we want more people creating? And don't we want people creating things at a beginner level so that they can become intermediate and then advanced and then pro level? Do we only want people that are already pros? Like who's already a pro when you start out? Everyone has to start somewhere. And I know some people don't like the fact that anyone can share their music and they're like, oh, now that there's distro kid, every man of these dogs got an EP, everyone's <clears throat> got their music out there. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Because who's, the, who's to judge quality? Quality is always subjective. There is music that people think is amazing, that's on the radio, that's number one. I was, here's a side note. I, my, my new song is called Time McFlies. And I, I was trying to see if it was on Google Music yet or YouTube Music. So I said, uh, hey, Google, play Time McFlies by Pete Johns. And it says, Time Flies by Drake. I'm like, okay, fair enough. And this Drake song comes on. And I'm like, ugh, I don't think I've actually ever listened to a Drake song, but I really dislike it. But you know what? You know who likes Drake? most other people because he's the number one selling artist in the world. So is, is, does that mean he's good, bad, otherwise? No, it just means that he's an option. He's a choice. And the, I've, I've realized what, what all of the music that I get sent to me sounds like. Sounds like Drake. 
which is why I don't like much of it. But again, it's not about me and it's not about you and it's not about any one individual person. It is about the fact that having the variety of music, having everyone able to contribute their music, and it's kind of like the forum thing. Like I get, I get pissed off when people start having a go at other people in forums and jumping on and creating these flame wars about things because just scroll past. And it's the same with music. You don't like all the music being created by beginners in GarageBand? Just scroll past. You don't have to be part of that community. You don't have to be part of that environment at all. You can go and just listen to all of the artists that you like and completely ignore everyone else. But abundance is good. Competitiveness, I think, is overdone. And I don't think it's required all the time in the music space. What do you think? Uh, there we go. Um, so that's my that's my mini rant because I'm I'm a little bit uh, a little bit behind the eight ball today. Uh, let's uh, let's go in. So tip of the week. I'm going to make this one quick too because uh, again we are we are short on time here. We'll jump back into Garage Band and make sure we're set up here. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Okay. Oh, got a bit of delay here with my things. So tip of the week is managing files in GarageBand. So whether you're on GarageBand Mac or GarageBand iOS, this will be relevant. There's two places you can store files, basically. There's locally and there's in the cloud. Now, GarageBand is good because it gives you the option to integrate with iCloud Drive. So iCloud Drive is Apple's cloud storage platform. You can get to it here in GarageBand. The other place is on my iPad or on my iPhone. So you'll notice that I don't have very much stored here on my iPad. Reason being that anything stored here is not backed up. Anything stored in your iCloud Drive is automatically backed up to the cloud and that's cool. It means that you can use the same stuff on your iPad and your iPhone and it means that it's always gonna be backed up to the cloud, meaning your iPhone falls in a toilet, you can actually recover it. You get a new iPhone, you say recover my files, boom, they're back. So how do you keep everything? Because look at this, I got I got stuff everywhere here. I got I got to do some I got to do some cleaning up. So how do you get this cleaned up? Well, first of all, let's delete out things that we don't need here. So I happen to know anything called my song, I just get rid of. So what I've done here is we'll actually we'll hit done on that. We're going to hit select and we're going to tap on all these my songs. These are just things that I've started doing usually for things on this show. So we'll tap all those. We'll hit the delete button. They're gone. Now they're not really gone. I'll show you where they go in a minute. We've got some other things here. So like, why do I have this acoustic jam here? I shouldn't have that there. I'm going to tap that. I'm going to move that. I'm going to put that here into my ideas folder because I happen to know that it's an idea. So that's gone. This one here is uh, an in-progress song that my daughter's doing. So I'm going to tap and drag that one and pop it in the in-progress folder. Uh, this Spy From A Distance, it's a copy. That's one I was using for a demo. We can delete that. Same with this one down here. Same with this one down here. They're all just demos and things. All right, we're, we're getting there. And I don't even know why I have this fence sitter version here. We're just going to delete that. All right, so we're looking good here. Now, this is what I have. We'll, uh, we'll come in here. So this is what I use. I've got a bunch of different folders here, and we can actually change the way these are displayed by coming up here. We'll list them by name so that we can see how they look. So in my GarageBand for iOS folder, so you've got iCloud Drive, and if we come in here, we're in my GarageBand for iOS folder. This is how I organize things. I've got one ideas folder, see 64 items in there. I've got an in progress folder with 10 items that I'm working on. I've got my completed folder with 31 items with all of my completed stuff. More my background music, miscellaneous for dumping ground for stuff. I've got my tutorial songs that I use in these sort of videos, my incomplete songs that I just got to a point and went, nah, can't be bothered anymore. And I've got some archive versions and a space for collaborations. Now you don't have to use exactly this setup, but what I do recommend is instead of having a folder, a default folder that looks like this, yeah? This is my ideas folder. It looks like a dog's breakfast, but out here it's all nice and clean. And my in progress is just this small number of tracks. And in fact, some of these have even finished now. Like this one, We Will Rise Together, is actually finished. So what I could do is I can actually move these. So I happen to know that anything We Will Rise Together, we can actually grab here, we can move, and we can plonk in completed. So we can start doing a little bit more. And you'll notice in completed, I've got sub projects there for, for things like my EPs and albums. We can move that there. So spending a little bit of time just tidying up your folders in here is going to help you out. And it's gonna give you a nice clean space 
to start creating and to share your GarageBand projects. The final tip here though is when you delete things, they don't really get deleted. So if you're running out of space, then the cool thing to do is to jump in here and go to your recently deleted items. So if we go to recently deleted, I got all this business because I've been deleting stuff and it doesn't actually go away until we come in here. It will go away 30 days later, but if you wanna free up that space right now, we can come into recently deleted, we can select and we can delete all. And there you go, it'll say, do you want to permanently delete these? Yes, we do. Boom, they're gone. We've freed up that space. We are good to go. So that is my little tip for managing your files there. Create some subfolders. And if you don't know how to do that, by the way, all we need to do is tap on this button here, create a new folder. We call it, I like to put a number in front of it. So I just put one and ideas. I'll just put some extra S's because it's different. And there you go. It'll put that in order. And then to delete things, we just tap and hold on them and you can delete there. I've got a complete video if you search my name, Pete John's iOS files about the files app and managing your files in GarageBand. And the good thing about this is that you can do exactly the same with your GarageBand for Mac folder. Have it on your iCloud drive, make sure that it backs up because there is nothing worse than losing your hard work. And if it is just on a hard drive or if it's just on your iPad or iPhone and nowhere else, and that iPhone or iPad goes for a swim in the toilet or the, I, or the Mac hard drive crashes, which I know happened to my friend Glenn Clark and has happened to many of us in the past, then that is something that you need to be wary of. We are super low on time, so we're actually gonna have to skip the, uh, the app of the week but I'll, I'll let you know what I was going to do just so that uh, we need to give this some time in a future show, but we've, we've gone over time. And uh, the, the app of the week that I wanted to talk about is for creating, where are we? Is for creating video with your GarageBand projects. And it is LumaFusion. And the reason I wanted to talk about LumaFusion, this one here, is that it is a very cool app and it is going to be the future of video creation. I'm telling you right now, I'm calling it right now. LumaFusion, if you're not familiar with it, it is available on iPad. It's available on iPhone. In fact, uh, if you've ever seen a video on this channel, it's, it's edited here in LumaFusion and I use LumaFusion for basically everything <laughs> and it's a super cool app. Uh, you can have up to six channels of audio, six channels of video. You can do all sorts of cool effects in there. It's compatible with the new Mac M1s. It's gonna absolutely crush on the new iPad M1s and it's definitely part of Apple's strategy moving forward. If you've noticed in the recent Apple updates, they've gone away from talking about things like Premiere and even Final Cut and LumaFusion seems to be the new favorite child when it comes to video content creation. So I highly recommend LumaFusion. I've got videos here on the channel about it and we will cover it maybe next week in, uh, in next week's show or maybe in a standalone video through the week. In fact, I'll probably cover it uh, in my Patreon Patreon Live. So um, yeah, if you're a patron, uh, then uh, we'll, we'll do that in our, our Patreon Live show that's coming up this week. And if you're not a patron, uh, you may want to consider joining because if you like some of the more behind the scenes stuff, I've been sharing some behind the scenes videos this week and uh, a lot of folks I know have been digging those. So if you want to uh, if you want to check those out and uh, join the community, a smaller, closer, tighter knit community, uh, patreon.com slash Pete Johns is where you want to head to. Uh, we've got, you know, we, we share a bunch of stuff there, additional videos in there. Uh, you get a direct sort of line into me. A lot of folks will message me on Twitter and Facebook and email and to be very honest, it's super challenging for me to keep up with that stuff. But those that are on the Patreon, uh, not only do you have me, but you've got other people as part of that community and we do live streams and stuff. And, and in a recent live stream, in fact, uh, Gary Hubbs, who we talked to uh, talked about at the start, uh, we helped him with some videos. And, and I noticed on his last video, uh, he's actually taken on some of the tips that we shared there. So if you are if you are a creator and you're looking to, to take your creating to the next level and you want to support me and help keep the lights on here at Studio Live today, uh, then uh, yeah, for as little as $1 per month, you can become a patron of the channel and we do appreciate you and thank you and shout out to everyone who is already a patron here on Studio Live today. Uh, finally, we've got our resource of the week and yeah, gonna be super self-serving again here because once more, if you found all of the cool things uh, that we talked about here today cool about GarageBand, you may want to check out my GarageBand Beginners course. And yes, I am still working on the advanced course. I had a few people asking me about that recently. It is still in the works, just taking a bit of time because I've had other things going on with my QB 
Bases series and a bunch of other stuff, but it is still coming here. But if you go to studiolivetoday.com slash courses, you can pick up the beginner's guide. It's five hours of hand-picked content, fully searchable, all of the different links that can go in there. It'll send you out to the YouTube channel if there's stuff that it needs to. And there is an interactive chat. So again, if you're not a patron and you want more direct access to me, there's an interactive chat in there. So if you are looking for something, you're searching for EQ and you're like, Pete, you don't really tell me how to do a high pass filter in here. I'm pretty sure I do, but let's just say I don't. You can say, hi, Pete, uh, any tips on high pass filtering? And I'll go, yeah, I've got a video on my channel. Check out this one about the high pass filter. So uh, it's a pretty good deal. And again, it's $10. Because I'm, I, this is this isn't your ninety seven dollar you know entry course. This isn't your free ebook that puts you into a sales funnel so that I can sell you a bunch of other crud. This is just I wanted to make sure that there was something for folks who are time poor but just want to crack on with GarageBand, start recording and start getting it themselves happening with their music. So studiolivetoday.com slash courses is the place to go. That is going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you got some value out of this one. If you did, you can hit the big thumbs up. If you didn't, hit the thumbs down button twice. That's not my joke. It's Mike over at Creative Source. But no, thank you all for being here. And if there's someone in your life that you think would benefit from this sort of show or that you think should get into GarageBand or that you think might be GarageBand curious, then uh, send them a link to this show. Sharing is caring. Sharon is Karen. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, shout out to everyone on the channel. Again, uh, I'll, uh, we, uh, we've got another video tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm sharing a video uh, about how I actually optimize my videos on YouTube. So that was one from a creator town hall a couple of weeks ago. I've got a review of the iRig uh, Pre 2 coming up too, which is going to be pretty cool. And uh, for my patrons, we'll be having a live stream in the next day uh, where we'll go through a whole bunch of other stuff. So thank you all for being here. Please be kind to yourselves, be kind to others, and uh, keep creating. See you soon.